I am going to read the scripture, Jeremiah 33, <coughs> verses 14 to 16. Hear the word. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. So since the um, uh, lapel mic, I'm going to just use the pulpit mic this morning. And um, it is good to be here uh, together. Uh, we were very thankful. Uh, I was very thankful. Our family was very thankful, as I mentioned, to host my family last week and to have a week of vacation during Thanksgiving. Um, and so um, we were very blessed um, uh, to have a wonderful Thanksgiving meal with uh, too much turkey and too much pie. Uh, too much, and uh, I felt like I had to go on a fast this past week to, to, to stop eating all the pie that I had left over. Um, but it was a very uh, wonderful blessing to have my parents, uh, my aunt, uh, Carol, my mom's sister, uh, Janet's mom, and my brother, Steve, and his wife, Kathy, with us uh, for the Thanksgiving holiday. And um, uh, before I, I move forward, though, I, I do want to mention that I realize that we did not announce that usually on the first Sunday of the month, uh, we celebrate communion as a church family. Um, but this Advent season, we decided to move our communion service to the third Sunday. And the reason for that is that each Sunday has a theme. And this Sunday's theme is sight. Uh, next Sunday's theme is going to focus on sound and the service will include a lot of music. And then the following Sunday after that is the idea of taste. And so we will taste and see that the Lord is good by having communion on December 17th. Now mentioning my, my family, um, I wanted to, to share how my sister-in-law, Kathy, she has a gift for home decorating. If you go into her house, it's like you're almost in one of those like, uh, like a, a magazine spread that you might see in like a home and garden, a better home and garden. She, she's very gifted with it and she loves to watch different home design shows and a number of years ago she discovered the store terrain which is in glenn mills pennsylvania now it just so happened they chose to stay in a hotel while they were visiting us like a mile from that store so of course on saturday morning um wendell and i spent time with my brother steve and kathy browsing at terrain now i had to check out their christmas trees because, you know, they have this picture here of their Christmas tree lot. They look really good, don't they? But last year on December 17th, I happened to be at Terrain for a wedding. And before the wedding started, I recall perusing their Christmas lot and it was a lot less filled. And instead of finding nice trees like this, I found trees that look more like this tree in this picture. Now, while the lighting is intriguing and, um, you know, I find that intriguing. What I found intriguing last year when I first encountered these trees at ter Terrain was that what I would call a Charlie Brown Christmas tree was selling for $178. I was surprised, I was perplexed, a bit dumbfounded that people would spend that amount for a tree that looked like that without those lights. Ah, but perhaps, you know, to each their own, and if they feel their money is being well spent there, I guess that's all right. But regardless of my personal Christmas tree preferences, my visit to Terrain last Saturday reminded me that Christmas, of course, will soon be here. How could it not with all the holiday decor available to purchase there? And we purchased a small tree, not an artificial tree. It was on sale, 30% off. But when we see something in life, we respond to it. So I want to know, what are some of the sights that you've seen already this year that tell you that Christmas is coming? What are some sights that you have seen? Yell them out. Don't be bashful. What have you seen? Amazon trucks. Amazon trucks. There you go. 
outside decorations, Christmas shows, Hallmark movies, Hallmark movies, <laughs> credit card charges. That's a kid saying that. <laughs> Candy canes in the Christmas store, right? There's lots of sights that we see leading up to Christmas. We went to Six Flags on Veterans Day. We saw workers putting up, you know, Christmas lights. Um, you might see Salvation Army kettle store, uh, kettles in front of stores. And of course, there's seasonal aisles in our department stores. And of course, those start going up when? Uh, August, August, September, <laughs> October. Here's one more sight from my family. Last weekend, this told us Christmas was soon to be here. Uh, Frankie and Wendell are Boy Scouts and they have an annual Christmas tree fundraiser. So last Sunday, and by the way, I've now realized I'm never taking off that Sunday again. I can get out with work. We were helping the Boy Scouts unload that truck. And it was amazing to watch them unload 660 trees in 90 minutes. And so whether it's trees or lights or something else, these sites tell us that Christmas is near and they build a sense of anticipation. And I am anticipating that the 68 trees that Frankie counted last night at 8 p.m. that I'm hoping that all those trees sell before 3 p.m. today when our next shift is. <laughs> today is the first Sunday of Advent filled with waiting and anticipation. The gospel reading for our first Sunday in Advent speaks of unexpected sights, as you see on the screen, talking about the sun being darkened and the moon not giving off its light. The powers in the heavens will be shaken and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And that reading ends with the exhortation to keep awake. At the beginning of Advent, we listen to scriptures that speak of Jesus' second coming, but we also turn to Hebrew poetry. And Pat read our scripture this morning from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. That is speaking of the promise to King David, that King David would always have a ruler on his throne. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it, meaning the city, will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. In this passage, the prophet Jeremiah offers a sign of hope to the people of Israel and to the people of Judah. He anticipates a future where a ruler from the branch of David will be raised up. And this ruler will rule rightly with justice and righteousness. Now, as the author of our Advent study pointed out in his book, we might expect or we might imagine Jeremiah writing this hopeful piece of poetry in the evening illuminated by the fire sitting near the hearth. But that is not what is happening. Instead, Jeremiah is looking out over the horizon and he sees flames as the holy city Jerusalem burns. You see, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet in 625 BC and he lived during the last, uh, during the, the time of the last of Judah's kings, before they were sent off into exile in Babylon. His nickname was the Weeping Prophet. His words were heavy. They were filled with lamentations. In fact, he's thought to be the author of that book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. But at the same time, while at times his words were heavy, here in this passage, we have words that are filled with hope. In response to those who were saying of Jerusalem that it is a waste without human beings or animals, in spite of that destruction, in spite of that scene of devastation, he anticipates a different future. 
He says that in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, there once more will be heard voices of mirth and voices of gladness. He paints a picture of renewal and continuity of life in weddings and thanksgiving offerings. And he says that there will be healing for the people and there will be shepherds in the fields resting their flocks. And then in the excerpt we heard in this passage, that picture includes a righteous ruler. And so the restoration of fortunes is not simply a matter of personal abundance or a personal merriment making, but it includes the reestablishment of systems of governance in a religious cult that will rightly lead the affairs of the people and their worship of the Lord, right? And Jerusalem will be called, the Lord is our righteousness because the city becomes a place of God's rule and the human ruler is the agent of that rule. And those who dwell in the city of God know that the city has been delivered redeemed and cared for by the Lord. And so Jeremiah lives between two poles. On one is despair, on the other hope. On one side terror, on the other side dancing. One side is warning, the other is pardon. One side is fear, the other is hope. And so there's more to Advent than waiting and anticipation. There is hope, and this Sunday is designated as the Sunday of hope. You see, Jeremiah looks, and where others only see destruction, he expects rebirth. In his book, Matt Rawl draws a distinction between anticipation and expectation. We talked about this in the adult small group at 930. And we discussed what is the difference between anticipation and expectation. He says that anticipation is responding to what is known. He said that if Jeremiah only had anticipation, he might have anticipated an everlasting Babylonian empire, right? A people destroyed and a God forgotten. But Jeremiah has expectation. He proclaims that even in the fire, God is doing something wonderful. And so the text reminds us that we need hope. Rawl says anticipation plus hope equals expectation. And so Advent is not just a season of anticipation, it's a season of expectation. And the journey from one to the other hinges on hope. So let me ask you a couple questions this morning. How do you define the difference between anticipation and expectation in your life story? How do you define the difference between anticipation and expectation in your faith story. We gather during Advent and we anticipate the coming of God, but do we expect God to come as an infant child? And do we anticipate that when Jesus comes to save us, do we expect salvation to come through a cross? Have you ever had an experience where anticipation became a surprising expectation? Where whatever you were anticipating, perhaps not going well, ended up being filled with hope? I had such an experience this past week. I had lots of anticipations about buying a Christmas tree this year. But then it became a surprising expectation. Yeah, you see my family <laughs> uh, going, uh-oh, what are we going to say here? 
It's all about me, don't worry. It became a surprising expectation when we found a Christmas tree in our neighborhood swap. They had bought a tree from the Boy Scouts, and it wasn't quite what they uh, anticipated or expected, and then I think their daughter resented it. <laughs> so they posted on the swap that they had this tree for sale, and they were hoping to recoup some of their money. Now, Janet and I saw this on the swap, and we said, hey, we can get that. That's going to solve our problem of what we're going to do for our Christmas tree this year. So I wrote her a note. We wrote a note together. We said, dear so-and-so, we have a disagreement when it comes to Christmas trees. I said, my wife wants to put up her skinny, sad-looking, five-foot fake tree, but I want a real tree. But she doesn't want to spend $85 to $100. She says we should give the money to the church. We saw your post and thought it would be a compromise for us. Will you take 50 bucks for your tree? We realize this is less than you're asking, but you'll get $50 in the satisfaction of helping your neighbors, your neighbors settle their disagreement. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> Our neighbor wrote back, thanks for your offer, accepted. And then she went on to share her Christmas tree challenge <laughs> and how she bought a new tree, but the husband, <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to buy a new tree. <laughs> you see, anticipating is responding to what is known. I was anticipating difficulty in making our tree decision. I was anticipating that no matter what decision was made, someone would be disappointed in our family. But I couldn't prepare for expectation. I couldn't prepare someone offering a real live Christmas tree on the neighborhood swap that we could get for fairly cheap. Expectation changes what we see. Others see a city laid waste, but Jeremiah looks up with eyes of hope and offers expectation of rebirth. What are you anticipating that needs a touch of hope? to become expectation this morning? What are you anticipating that needs a touch of hope to become expectation? Let me ask one other question. What do you see in the world? What do you see in the world? I don't know about you, but when I look at the world, I anticipate more of the same. More hunger, more war, more death, poverty, prejudice. More of that which goes against right living and relationship with God and our neighbors. This is what I anticipate, but anticipation leaves out God. Anticipation leaves out hope. This past week, I subscribed to Diana Butler Bass's Advent devotional titled, A Beautiful Advent. December at the Cottage with Diana Butler Bass. I resonated with what she wrote when she introduced her Advent devotionals. A beautiful Advent. Why a beautiful Advent? She said she needed to be reminded of beauty. Why? Because it's easy to be overcome by despair. Because every day we're besieged by that ugliness in the world. And that makes it hard to remember the loveliness of our lives and creation. Even the word beauty, she said, might seem shallow or self-interested or even meaninglessness, meaningless amid the suffering of today. We might wonder how can we sing about peace and faith and joy and hope now? But in the words of Thomas Troger, who wrote, in a world filled with terrors, 
The heart longs for a vision of divine beauty. And when the church fails to attend to beauty, the life of faith often becomes grim and onerous. What would it mean for our church to be a place of beauty? And so we gather together on this first Sunday of Advent to create a place of beauty. It's good that we're gathering to transform our sanctuary. It's good that we're putting up lights in our homes. It's good that we are gathering around Advent candles and wreaths every day. It's good that we see a little more kindness in the store clerks at this time of the year. It's good that we see Amazon trucks, I guess. I'm not sure. But it's good that we're listening to Christmas carols on the radio. It's good that we're tasting that favorite cookie or sharing the warmth of a hug with a friend or a family member. It's good because these symbols, because these things are symbols of beauty that help us move to hopeful expectation. I hope we can experience Christmas together this year through the sights and the sounds of Advent. I invite you to join with me in a beautiful Advent. The link was sent um, in the email to the congregation. I can also send it to you personally if you would like to join with me in that Advent devotional journey with Diana Butler Bass. It's good to do these things, to see these things, because they help us move to hopeful expectation. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we're thankful for this day that you have blessed us with, to gather together, to look forward and to experience the hope of your coming, to anticipate and to expect that you will act. Lord, we pray that we would create room to receive you, to welcome you, that we might experience your joy, your love, your peace, and your hope this Advent season. Amen. I invite you to stand and respond to God's